Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I had a bunch of stuff I want to talk to you about at first, but I'm going to skip all that for one thing in particular, actually two things. I um, spent some time with Reverend Bob Bondurant yesterday, and he sends all of you his love. And he wanted to make sure that I told you all that, that he thinks of you often, and that he loves you, and that he's thinking of you right now, as a matter of fact. Um, at, there's a couple of announcements that we can make later, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Presbytery meeting yesterday. Uh, Jessica was in attendance, so was I. And um, I don't know how much you know about how these Presbyterian meetings go, but a lot of times it gets pretty tedious. But it was pretty good yesterday. But there was one thing in these discussion groups they were talking about was how to make sure that we had flourishing churches. And nobody could define what a flourishing church was. Uh, was it the bank account? How many people are in attendance? Maybe that's what it means. And I was thinking about us here at Gilbert. Um, all I know about this is that there are people who have food right now that wouldn't have if it weren't for people in this congregation. There are people who have clothing right now. There are people who have educational support. What happens every time somebody in this congregation has a problem or a tragedy happen? What happens when somebody in this congregation has something to celebrate? Love in action, doing love happens constantly here. So if you ask me, I don't care how many people are in the pews, whether it's 2, 20, or 200, this is a flourishing church because there is that much love. So that's my definition of it. And if you ever wondered whether we're a flourishing church or not, I say we are. Does anybody disagree? All right. <laughs> uh, and if you do disagree, that's okay. I mean, we could talk about bank accounts and attendance and all that and uh, some kind of strange strategy to change all that. Uh, but uh, if we're here to do the work of God for the glory of God, we are certainly doing it. And that means we're a flourishing church. And if you would, please join me in that call to worship. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not desire, despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. And if you would, join me in our opening prayer. We praise God, who is known to us in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray for God to bless us so that we may be a blessing to others. We pray for Jesus to be with us, and he promised to be whenever we gather in his name. We pray for the Spirit to make our worship holy, joyful, and true. Amen. And if you're able, please stand and we'll join in singing hymn number 487, When Morning Gilds the Sky.
Let us confess our misdeeds and our selfish inclinations, first with our silent prayer of confession, and then let us join our voices together in our corporate prayer. Let us pray. And if you will join me. God, our fears and prejudices run deep. Sometimes we can only see our own point of view. We stick with those who are like us, rarely venturing outside of our comfort zones. We do not hear those crying for justice and true peace. We blame those who are suffering and in need instead of standing by them. We deny the power of your gospel to unite us with those who are different from us. Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Open us to new possibilities of life for all your people and use us to enact the new life given in Christ. Amen. God's life-giving word and spirit conquer the powers of sin and death. Thanks be to God for the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us confirm what we believe with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Everybody can be seated. I keep forgetting to say that, by the way. So I'm glad you guys just do it on your own, because I will forget. Um, is Mandy or anybody want to do the announcements, or is it going to be me? Mandy's not here. So I guess uh, it can be me. It can be you, and I want to oh, uh, oh, uh, talk about this real quick mm -hmm. first. All right. So before we get to the announcements, um, to uh, expand on what Jay said about Presbytery meeting yesterday, uh, we saw a lot of old friends, and in addition to Bob Bondurant, uh, Jim and Karen Robinson said specifically to tell everybody hello, and they love us and miss us. Uh, Barbara Shelfont, uh, Maureen Wright, um, just so many old friends that, that we got to see yesterday. So everybody sends their greetings. We were invited to look at the library of Dr. Ed Bowen and take anything that we wanted from it. So I found his book about me. And I will put it um, out in the narthex for everybody to look at. I think he filled it out when he was, what, we five. So um, it was just real special to see something that Ed had done. And there's some school certificates in the back and so forth. So I wanted to share that with you. So that will be in the narthex for everybody to look at. A uh, couple of announcements now. Next week, uh, Pastor Reverend Garrick. Uh, will be here from Logan, is a part of our pastor exchange program that we're doing in the cluster. Started out as a goofy idea that turned into something real and uh, really positive. The whole point is that all of the congregations in our cluster, this will include Canada, Kentucky, which is actually in another presbytery, but uh, uh, Clothier, which we're trying to make contact with, but Logan, Gilbert, and Williamson all together, uh, we meet every week, uh, me and the other reverends, pastors, and uh, to do lectionary study and to talk about pastoral issues. 
And one of the things that we think and we know uh, is needed in our cluster is for us to know each other and to love each other and to expand our church, uh, doing it together. Uh, so uh, you guys will need to know the other pastors, and I'll need to know the other congregation so we can do more of the work of God. And uh, the only thing I will say is you're not allowed to fall in love with Kevin and Bill and, and, and leave me out in the cold. Don't make me jealous because you don't want to see a jealous cow creaker on your hands. <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, Kevin will be here next week. You will love him. And then Bill will be here on the 18th. Meanwhile, I'll be at Williamson, Canada, and Logan uh, uh, as we do a rotation around. And it's important uh, to hear other voices preach the word, but it's also important for us, uh, the pastors, to uh, have a different group of people to preach the word to because it expands our points of view and expands uh, uh, what we think and what we know. And it becomes a challenge and some relief because you'll, you'll have a couple of weeks of relief from me. So that'll be helpful for everybody. Uh, also, uh, on Good Friday, uh, I'm going to open the church at noon, and it'll stay open until 6 or 7 o'clock that evening. Uh, there is not going to be a sermon or a service or anything like that. Uh, I will veil uh, the cross and the other sacred items uh, in the uh, sanctuary, and you'll be invited to come and sit in the peace of the sanctuary and contemplate the death of Christ. On Sunday, that Sunday, Easter Sunday, what we'll be doing is celebrating the resurrection. But I don't want to sell the death of Christ short either. Uh, so if you are so inclined, it's an experience you won't forget to come in and sit and clear your mind and think about the sacrifice Christ made for us. And Good Friday is the day to do that. So you're all welcome, anybody is welcome. Whether uh, they're a member here or not, I will be here with a little handout that you can read. It'll have some scripture suggestions for you if you want that. It'll explain what we're doing, but that's what we'll be doing on Good Friday. On Monday, Thursday, that's the day before, uh, I still am not ordained, so I can't do communion, uh, but uh, you're welcome to either Williamson or Logan, your choice, for a Monday, uh, Thursday service. That's where we celebrate the Last Supper and commemorate the betrayal of Christ and all that. And then Good Friday we'll do our thing here. And then Easter Sunday we'll get back to the celebrating of the resurrection. Which is uh, something we all are anticipating now in the season of Lent. Uh, and uh, I think, the, uh, what else is there? Did I miss something? Uh, and I think the, the storehouse still needs uh, canned green beans. And remember always, uh, the canned ravioli and spaghetti packs a pretty powerful nutritional punch. So all those, that's always needed. So, and you can leave it out here in the narthex and we'll get it to the storehouse. All right, uh, can the kids come up for a minute? You guys are, I got good news and bad news for you. <laughs> and we'll decide which one you want first. Oh, we didn't do joys and concerns, did we? That's okay. I'll do it after. All right, uh, you guys can have a seat if you want, or you can stand, because the... Uh, this is going to go pretty quickly. Do you want the good news first or the bad news first? No. The bad news is I've got a homework assignment for you that you have to turn in next Sunday. No. Well, yep, yeah, that's the bad news. The good news, when you turn it in, uh, you'll get something special. So that's the uh, so that's the good news and the bad news. And actually, the bad news is kind of good news. Uh, it's the good news of Jesus Christ, which we'll talk about shortly. Who knows what Lent is? Lent, the, the, the season of Lent. We're in Lent right now. Do you, it, do you guys know what that might be? Okay, what it is, it, it means lots of things. It's the 40 days before Easter. It's where we commemorate what Jesus did for us and his sacrifice. His 40 days being tempted in the desert also is commemorative of the 40 days and 40 nights it rained for Noah's flood and many other mentions of 40 days and 40 nights in the Bible. Now, I'm not going to get too deep into it because it means all kinds of different things. But what your homework assignment is, is I want you to write down 40 things that you're thankful for. Sounds like a lot, right? Well, if you start today and you, get <laughs> you feel the same way I do about homework, this is why I'm giving it to you and not myself. You know, see, because I've already been through all this. And trust me, one day you'll miss school, but just not right today. Uh, but write down 40 things that you're thankful for. 
because, and one will be Jesus, right? That's an easy one. So right there is already one. So you've only got 39 more to go. <laughs> so what we're going to do is that uh, a lot of people do 40 different things. Uh, what I do for Lent uh, to commemorate all of it is I take an item that I own, whether it be a shirt or uh, maybe a book, and I put it into a bag each day of Lent. So at the end, I have 40 items, and I donate it to the Salvation Army or something or another group like them. All right, so what I would like you to do is simply write down 40 things that you're thankful for. It could be simple. What, 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 what's one thing you're thankful for? Uh, How about... Uh, okay, yeah. yeah, that's a good one. That's a really good one. Uh, how about, uh, are you thankful for mashed potatoes? See, that's one of the big things I'm thankful for is mashed potatoes. Yeah. But there's a lot more. So it doesn't have to be anything big. And you may not even want to think it's important. But if you're thankful for it, write it down. Give me 40 of them. And next week you'll get something special. That'll be uh, your, uh, your reward at the end. Now, that's better than school homework, right? Because what do you get out of school homework once it's done? A grade? Yeah, see, that's not, not as much fun as what I'm going to be giving you next week when you give me 40 items. So, please do that, and remember, as we get closer and closer to Easter, that we got to think about what happens on Easter. What happens on, what happened on Easter? The, the Easter Bunny came. That's true enough. <laughs> he does, the Easter Bunny does come. What else happens on Easter? Jesus rose from the dead. He did. He, he was resurrected and saved us all through his sacrifice, right? And, because, and that means we also get to be resurrected. What's that? He does, that's right. He comes back from the dead, he's raised, and then pretty much 40 days after that goes and ascends into heaven. So that 40 days thing is uh, something you'll hear a lot as you learn more and more about the Bible. So are you guys ready for your homework assignment? You think no. you get that done? No. It's only 40. Now I know you've got the day off tomorrow, right? So you can probably do it all tomorrow. I think you have the day off anyway, right? Yes. You're just not going to answer any more of my questions, huh? What if I brought you mashed potatoes? Would that help? <laughs> Mac and cheese. That's even better. All right. So there's your homework assignment, and then at the uh, and then uh, next Sunday uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Lent. By the way, it also means spring, so we're getting close to springtime now, right? So it means all kinds of things. So we'll talk more about it. But I need forty things that you're thankful for. And we'll talk about those as well. So let's pray a little bit. Father, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to sacrifice for us and to save us. We are thankful for so many things, and we're going to be thankful for at least 40 things, which we'll report next week. All things in your name, amen. Thank you all so much. And if you need pencil and paper, I can get it to you. Uh, do we have any uh, joys? Uh, I forgot to do that part. Any joys that you guys would like to talk about? Yeah, yeah, it's a good thing that I only uh, that I didn't have the stuff for them today. <laughs> I'll have it for them next week. Uh, what's that? Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, I'll have to give it to Kevin so he can uh, do it. I'll talk to Kevin. Thank you for reminding me in my brain. This is why I'm the most or unorganized preacher in history. Uh, but uh, uh, I would like to say a joy that. Uh, Yesterday at that Presbytery meeting, and I'll report to you, is that it's just no matter what happens and how some of the votes and all the presentations can get pretty boring and tedious, it is a place that is lousy with Presbyterians. And that's always a good thing is to be surrounded by Presbyterians. So that's a joy uh, that we got together like that. Does anybody else have any other joys? Wonderful. And uh, I'm glad that uh, we avoided some more flooding. Uh, there are some people. We've got river flooding happening, especially around Wheeling. Uh, so that would be a concern that we could pray for later. But, and I hate to put it off on somebody else. I'm just sort of glad it wasn't us for once on that. Not happy that somebody else is dealing with it, but I am happy we're not. Oh, yeah. By the way, that was... Uh, uh, even though I wasn't supposed to clap. I'll try not to do that next time. And that was Vivaldi's spring, <laughs> by the way. Nah, appropriate. It's not, when does it become officially spring? All right, I know we've got that spring forward with the clock coming soon, so make sure you do it that day so you're not late for church. 
I did that one year, showed up an hour late, and luckily so did everybody else, or at least half the people. Um, other joys I could think of is just the fact that we're here, we're together, and we're able to worship God in a free country uh, and, uh, and live in the freedom that comes from faith in Christ. Any other joys? How about concerns? Do we have some people that uh, have concerns that may need some prayer? I'd like to add for all those who are in need and uh, are wondering where their next meal is coming from. Unless, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, and our, the people who own and operate uh, the funeral home. I understand they will rebuild and uh, they will uh, be, will continue. So, uh, which is as much as we all want to avoid funerals as much as we can. That service that they provide is essential for families who are at the worst part of the of life. Uh, let's remember all these in prayer throughout our service today and through the next week. And uh, I think I forgot an announcement. And also, uh, do we have any birthdays? Anybody that are willing to admit one at least? Uh, one of the announcements is, uh, I don't know if you guys know what Grow Appalachia is. Uh, but it's where they will give you seeds and the tools and the implements you need uh, and uh, a couple of classes on uh, growing your own vegetables and plants. Um, that's Tuesday, right? Tuesday, if, um, if the schools aren't out. Right, so right. They, they will pick it at the state employee building. It's a big south man between 10 and 3. You can kind of make the whole time. You can do it for a couple of hours. It's for you to be enrolled and you can do a soil test and meet everyone. It's still in be Sias. And it's a wonderful program. And here's the thing is, you can choose to donate the food you grow to a food bank. You can sell it at a farmer's market or eat it yourself. And uh, it's uh, and they provide so much support. All you've got to do is basically diagram what kind of plot you're going to do. And they will teach you how to do all these things. And... Uh, uh, it, I, I've watched hundreds of pounds of food get produced by people doing this, and most of it go to food banks or to friends in need. So uh, that's Tuesday at South Man Elementary School. All right, uh, if you would, let's do hymn number 84. In, uh, oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. No, I, I was having trouble reading my handwriting. It's number 84.
Let us not only pray for illumination, but pray that I can get it straightened out up here today. Sorry about all the uh, mishaps. Lord, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say for us today. Amen. Our epistle reading this morning is Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. Hear now the word of the Lord. For the promise he, should, he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but when there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. The presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith, and he gave glory to God. Being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised, therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words it was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoning to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and raised for our justification. <clears throat> our gospel reading this morning is Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and then three days later rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciple, he rebuked Peter, said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciple and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes into glory of his Father with the holy angels. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now last week I wore everybody out, including myself, with all the talk of evil and Satan and how Jesus was tested and how we are tested. Uh, just thinking about the intractability of evil and learning all this stuff is exhausting. So this week is going to be a little different. Uh, the sermon itself will be a little bit shorter. I know if most of you are thanking uh, God for that one. Uh, but it doesn't mean it's going to be light and frivolous like a snow day. The gospel passage today is absolutely pivotal. It is crucial. It is so much because our entire salvation and who we are is laid out for us in no uncertain terms in this very compact and short passage in the gospel according to Mark. But instead of facing evil, we'll be facing the incomprehensible and incomparable love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Much more pleasant than evil. So let's look at what Jesus was very directly telling the disciples and very directly telling us today. He tells us who he is. He tells us what he must do. And here's the good one. He tells us what we must do. Our passage today comes right after Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. Now, one thing we got to remember about this time and age, and we got to remember clearly that there were any number of messianic claims in the years before and after Christ was here on earth. Some of them somewhat legitimate in terms of how you define a Messiah. But the Messiah was expected to be and prophesied to be a king who would come and renew the world to make everything right. The first century Jews, that meant that the king of Israel 
would come back. A king would come to be a king of Israel, defeat the Romans, get rid of the Romans, and restore Israel as its own independent nation and great nation. That's what they thought the Messiah was. A king to come, and by setting everything right, they meant getting rid of the Romans. That's what the disciples expected, and everyone else expected Jesus to do. Now, up until this time, it looked like that's exactly what he was doing. He was putting things right by healing people, performing miracles, feeding people, and preaching love, and miracle after miracle, and sermon after sermon, and some strange teachings they weren't quite sure about, uh, but it looked like he was gaining all this popularity. All these followers were coming, feeding the 5,000, which was actually probably more like 15,000 because they were only counting men in that 5,000. Uh, and it looked like he was gathering basically an army to defeat the Romans. He was also turning the religious elite and the teachers of the law and everything they were about on their heads. He was really confusing to them. Imagine for a moment here what that must have been like for the followers of Jesus. All right, for that first year or so, or maybe a little bit more. To them, the king had arrived, and they knew him. He was a friend of theirs. They were seeing all these miracles. Uh, the overturn of Roman oppression was at hand. I mean, look at all this that's happening, and we get a front row seat. It was joy and learning and glory all the time. And then, at this very moment, all those happy and exciting feelings change. The music changes, so to speak. Jesus tells him he is a king. He is the king, but he's not going to a throne. He's going to a cross. Now imagine that for a minute. You've already imagined this joy, all this fun times you're having, all these wonderful things you're witnessing and doing while you're a disciple of Christ. Now he tells you he's not going to a throne. He's going to die on a cross. Here they're engaged in that joyful kind of dance we were talking about. Everything is wondrous and gleeful. And then all of a sudden, the dance partner just suddenly punches him in the face. Sounds like most of the dances I've got. <laughs> all right, I'm kidding because I don't dance. Uh, but we're all a little bit familiar with this, right? We can all relate. Life's going great. Then all of a sudden, something punches you in the face. We can all relate to that at least a little bit what the disciples were feeling at that moment. But I can't think of anything that would compare to hearing that the Messiah is going to have to suffer and die. That's two punches in the face or more. That revelation is so shocking and so out of bounds that Peter rebukes Jesus. Now this isn't going, you know, wagging his finger. He rebukes him. That's a strong word. That's what Jesus did to demons. Rebuking is to criticize and admonish someone times 100. So here's the rock. Cephas, Simon Peter, was actually rebuking Jesus, the Messiah. That's how shocking and jarring this was to the disciples. It's because they didn't know who Jesus was, and they had mistaken him for someone else. They had make his mistaken him for a king who was to go to a throne. Jesus tells them, yes, I'm the king, I'm the Messiah, but I'm going to a cross. In verse 31, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. He calls himself the Son of Man Many, many times in the Bible. It's his favorite, or at least his most common, self-description. And there are a bunch of explanations as to what the Son of Man means. And we'll get into all those sometime in the future. I don't want to go too far down a side road right now. But there is a specific and singular significance to Jesus calling himself the Son of Man on this specific and singular occasion. In the Hebrew Scriptures in Daniel chapter 7, there's a reference in Daniel's prophecy to someone who is like unto the Son of Man, a divine and heavenly figure who will come to make everything right. Jesus is telling us that's who he is. He is that divine and heavenly person who has come to make everything right. Then he says the Son of Man must suffer and die. Is at this point he's bringing two prophecies together, and that hadn't been done before. It at least appears to be the first time that was done, and it's earth-shattering. In Isaiah, again back to the Old Testament or the Hebrew scripture, there are many prophecies in Isaiah about a certain servant of the Lord who will come to suffer and die, to save everyone. Again, Jesus is telling us who he is one more time. He is the suffering servant, and he is that divine and heavenly figure who will make everything right. He's both of them. He's putting it together for the first time. So us, with the benefit of the Bible, the scripture, 
and 2,000 years of study and learning of it, this seems basic to us. What do you think the disciples felt about that? I mean, they knew Daniel, they knew Isaiah, they knew the scriptures extraordinarily well. And all of a sudden, Jesus is putting these two together. It's being revealed who he really is. He's both the suffering servant and the son of man. This is Jesus and who he is, and it just doesn't make any sense. If Jesus is the son of man who is here to make everything right, how can he do that if he's supposed to suffer and die? How is he going to do it? Now it's much easier to see why Peter reacted the way he did and began to rebuke Jesus. By the way, it's another example of that upside down, upside down kingdom I'm always yammering on about. In fact, this might be the primary example of the upside down kingdom. Jesus is about to turn the whole world upside down. Jesus is the son of man, a divine and heavenly king who is here to put everything right. And how is he going to do that? Is it going to be a victorious war? Is he going to perform some miracle and just make the Romans disappear? Nope. He's going to go to a cross and die. That's how he's going to turn the world upside down. That's how he's going to make everything right. He's going to suffer and die. And there it is, brothers and sisters. That's the whole thing. Everything we are, everything we will be, the entirety of our earthly lives and our eternal lives, every purpose, every answer, every single thing is right there. Jesus is going to make everything right. And it starts by suffering and dying on a cross. Jesus has told us exactly who he is and what he must do. Remember in the scripture, the word must is there. It isn't he wants to or he will. He must suffer and die. It's not what he wants to do, I'm sure. It's not what he was expected to do. We know that. He was expected to be a king on a throne instead of a king on the cross. It's what he must do. He must suffer and die in order to make everything right. He has to suffer and die to make us right. He must suffer and die so we could be relieved of the burden of sin, so we could be forgiven, so that we can stand justified before God. Otherwise, we're lost. Otherwise, we're under the law and not under grace. And otherwise, we're doomed because we do not have the ability to be 100% obedient to the law. It's not possible. Only one person ever did it, and he was fully human and fully God. Jesus Christ. We can't do it. We can't. Otherwise, we're lost if he doesn't suffer and die. We have no merit. We have no record we could stand on. We have to have Jesus' merit. We have to stand on his perfect record. And he gives it to us through this suffering and dying and then being resurrected. Now it begs the question though, why did Jesus do this? Why would he suffer? Why would he die? Why would God sacrifice his life and give up the whole of the universe? Why would he do this? The son, the word made flesh, gives up his eternal relationship and connection to the Father and the Holy Spirit, in addition to all the suffering and dying. He suffers the greatest loss, the greatest pain, the greatest torture. Why? Because of love. A love so vast, so pure, and so complete, and so overwhelming, we can't even comprehend that love. We can think about it, we can ponder it, we can worship it and be thankful for it, but can you truly understand that level of love, that much love, that kind of love. Now look, I love me some pancakes and sausage for breakfast. Especially when you dip the sausage into the syrup a little bit uh, before you eat it. I mean, I love that. And I love me some rock and roll music. Give me some Led Zeppelin or ACDC and I'm generally a happy man. I love my mother and my family so deeply that it's in every cell of my body. I love this church and all of you beyond anything I ever thought I would be capable of. I try to love God with everything that I am. I love my neighbors as myself. Think about that deep of love. Think about your deepest love for your children, your spouse. Think about all these things that you love and what you love the most. Get a good picture of the size of that love. And then realize that it's infinitesimally small compared to the love of Christ for us. And you see what that means? What that much love means? What this love means? There's nothing else. There is nothing else. That's what the universe is. 
That's what life is, is that love of Christ for us. Nothing can touch you. You're going to have pain. You're going to suffer. Things aren't always going to go your way. And one day you're going to shuffle off this mortal coil and die. But what is any of that, no matter what it is, compared to God's love and the eternal life and joy and glory you have coming? Doesn't even matter. All of that is who Jesus is and what he had to do and why he did it. Now, what does Jesus tell us we must do? We've got to take up a cross and follow it. Sounds pretty ominous, and it is. Unfortunately, because sometimes the silly nature of our culture and the way we use words, we end up making something truly meaningful like taking up a cross into a catchphrase. So let me make sure this is clear. Taking up your cross or having your cross to bear, as we say all the time, isn't like that crazy cousin who embarrasses everybody whenever there's a family gathering. Oh, look, Kurt, he's our cross to bear. That's not what it means. Or you can ask Jessica about what she had to deal with when she was sitting next to me yesterday at this Presbyterian meeting. I pestered her the entire time the same way I pestered my sister every time we were sitting in a pew at church. So that day, yesterday, I was her cross to bear, if you want to use the phrase the way we do in modern language. But that is not what taking up your cross means. It isn't even something very, very serious, like if you're a teacher right now. And you have a state legislature who would rather spend a gazillion dollars for drug tests and assets investigation to take food stamps away from poor people instead of spending millions of dollars to give you the raise you deserve. That is not even your cross to bear when it comes taking up your cross and following Jesus. It means you have to give up your life. You have to give up your life to have life. Our culture, our world tells us we are only valuable if we have a healthy and successful family or if we make a lot of money or if we are well regarded by other people and all that matches up with our desires, our internal desires, the life we want. We want to control our lives. We want to have certain things. We want the life we want. But to receive grace, salvation and justification, to take up your cross and follow Jesus you have to give up that life. It means we have to take up the cross and follow him, which means we have to give up that life and those desires to get the true and eternal life. We have to give ourselves over to Jesus completely. <coughs> Excuse me. We have to give up our freedom to have true freedom. Think about the freedom you get knowing that God loves you so much he died for you. And sacrificed everything for you. What else could touch you? That's freedom. <laughs> Why fear? Why worry about your life? We have to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Brothers and sisters, when you think about it, consider that it's like this. Life is going to be hard. And there's only one way to have eternal life. Give up the hard life. Get the eternal life. You're giving up your life after all. But if you take in the gospel... And allow it to change your heart, truly change your heart to take up a cross and follow Jesus. You have eternal life. And those words may be meaningless if you don't think about it clearly. Consider what that means. You will never die. And you will never feel pain. You will know nothing but joy and glory once you shuffle off that mortal coil and do that death thing that we're all so afraid of. It's fine to be afraid of that. But how afraid do you need to be when you know that that eternal life is coming, but you still got to take up your cross and follow Jesus? If you look at Jesus on the cross, dying for you, if you truly consider that and take the gospel into your heart, you'll gladly give up this life, your life, that life you want, those things you want. You won't want to do anything else. But take up a cross and follow Jesus. Peace be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. You stop us in our tracks, O oh God, with your reminder that discipleship is not a sometime thing. We are called to place our whole lives in your care, to follow you, to take up a cross, to serve you by caring for others, not just once in a while, but always. We admit that we're not always ready to do this. The demand is great, 
The need is great. Our energies are limited. Help us to place our trust and our lives in your care. You will give us the strength and courage that we will need to step on this journey, carrying our cross. Be with us. Help us to remember that your love is poured out for all your people. You are never far away, and we pray for these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. The world and those who live in it are his. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. What shall we give to the Lord for all his generous gifts? We shall offer to the Lord our great sacrifice of thanks.
us pray. As we offer our treasure and hearts to you, O oh God, may they be used to pass on the promise of hope, of peace, of life, and community to all in need of your gifts and presence in their lives. Amen. Let's sing hymn number 310, Jesus, the very thought of thee. into the world in peace. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. The God of peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, make you complete in everything good so that you may do God's will, working among us that which is pleasing in God's sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom the glory be forever and ever. Amen. Amen.